Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you for coming to be with me on this, the most important day of my life. Not my birthday. Not the anniversary of anything in particular. It's just simply the only day I have. And when people come to be with you at the most significant time in your life, the only day you have, you try to remember them. At least I do. And I will try to remember you because you're here with me on this the most important day of my life. I would like to thank Deborah and Joe and the members of the convention committee, the marvelous and wonderful event that they have put together. We talk about carrying a message There are many ways to carry a message. Only one of them is pontificating at a podium. And to put an event together like this, believe you me, was a marvelous and wonderful way of carrying a message, and I say thank you. I would also say thank you to Earl, formerly of the marvelous and wonderful Forest Hills Group in Queens, I believe, in a very low whisper, Earl put my name out there as the possibility of being a speaker at this convention. I would say thank you, too, to my marvelous and wonderful, beautiful hostess. I've come a long way that now I get assigned a hostess. Kate, who has done an excellent job for Sister Rose and myself in our time here in this holy place. And I would say thank you to anyone who spread the word that a convention was taking place and the different things that happen so that an event like this can take place. I say thank you for your service. About this hotel, the room that Sister Rose and I are sharing is bigger than any convent either us have lived in. You know, in the convent in old God's time, that means a long time ago, We called our bedrooms cells. And you could see why, because it was dangerous and unlawful that there be more than one person in that room. This morning, I was looking for Rose. in our room. (laughs) And I started ever so softly, Rose, Rose, and I didn't hear anything, so I got a little louder. She said, I'm on the telephone. Well, I looked at the telephone, and I didn't see Rose. And she said, I'm in the bathroom on the telephone. We have come a long way. I also have to tell you, or I choose to tell you, that Rose and myself have to leave at 5.30 a.m. in the morning 
because I have an assignment that's been on my calendar a day at a time for quite a while now to lead a retreat up in Connecticut. Now, you don't have to get up at five to say goodbye to us. It's okay. But we will be gone in the morning, uh, hopefully by that time, if God gives us tomorrow. Is this mic okay? The bishop, he was going around visiting different parishes, and he was finishing up at the last parish, and he was just about to begin Mass when someone came to him and said, Bishop, you have to wait because the mic system is not working and we have a full church here. So he said, fine, just let me know. So they gave him the eye, and he got up and he started offering Mass. And he, he knew there was something the matter with the mic. I mean, he could tell that it wasn't working properly. So he said, there's something the matter with this mic. And the congregation responded, and also with you. If you heard the one, and if you heard this one, it bears repetition. Repetition is good for us. You have taught me that. Of the farmer in the in a section of our country, and he came to his parish for the Sunday morning service, and he was sitting there by himself, and the minister walked in. And the minister said to him, he said, you know, he said, today I'm going to give my first sermon. And he said, I'm so nervous. And he said, you're the only one who has come. What do you think I should do? And the farmer said, well, if I had a load of hay and I went out to feed the cows and only one cow showed up, I'd feed the cow. And the minister said, you got it. Up into the pulpit he goes. An hour and 15 minutes later, he finishes. He comes down and he says to the farmer, what would you think? And the farmer said, well, if I had a load of hay, and I went out to feed the cows, and only one cow showed up, I don't think I'd give him the whole load. Now, if you didn't get that, you could talk to your sponsor. <laughs> and if you don't have a sponsor, as we say in the trade, you know the rest of the story. If you don't remember anything that I share with you this evening, please remember this one. Because this is the most important thing about me. And this is how I want to be remembered. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a woman. I'm a member of a religious community. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing. In particular, the marvelous and wonderful Forest Hills group in Queens, New York. And the last thing I always tell you about myself is my name. Incidentally, my name is Sister Maurice. Thank you. One of the things that I'm partial to in our fellowship is that it's a fellowship of equals. There are no titles in Alcoholics Anonymous. No one really cares what you do for a living. I like all of that. And yet, you have never been anything else in this fellowship other than Sister Maurice. Now, isn't that somewhat of a title? 
Well, for me, it's my name. It's the name I've been using most of my life. It's on all my important papers. It's on my driver's license. It's written up quite well in two police stations in the city of New York. But moreover, it's the name that I gave to you when I came into your beautiful presence a while back now. A call had been made for me, and I was to go to the Forest Hills group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I really wasn't quite sure that someone of my class and caliber should be going to such a place as AA. I was not a happy camper when I came to you. But little by slowly, that has all changed for me. So much so that I can say quite comfortably today, I choose to live the AA way of life. And when I talk about something being a way of life, it's not an incidental experience. It's not something I do when things are not going my way. A way of life to me is as much a part of me as my right hand and my left hand. And that's the way I see Alcoholics Anonymous today. But for starters, I went to this first meeting, and I went up the stairs and down the stairs and into a little room that we have there. And a fellow jumped right up, and he came running across the room, and he gave me a handshake like I hadn't had in quite a while. And he told me who he was, and he said, what's your name? I said, me? He said, yeah, what's your name? Oh, I said, I'm Sister Maurice. Now, this fellow didn't say... Your mother doesn't call you that, does she? And he didn't say to me, first I'll have to take it to the steering committee of our group and then to the business meeting of our group. The very next thing the man said was, Hi, Sister Maurice, you're welcome. And am I just a little over 27 years with you a day at a time? No one has even suggested to me that I call myself anything other than Sister Maurice. The name is important, but the most important thing about me is what I shared with you at the beginning, that I am an alcoholic. And each and every time I say that, beginning first, when I awaken in the morning, I may have one eye open and one eye closed, but I know I'm still here. The very first thing I do is announce before my God, I am an alcoholic. I choose to enter into my day in that way. And I hope and I pray and I do what's necessary. Because I do not want to reach a point where I would be going through the motions of being an alcoholic. Of course I'm an alcoholic. I've been one for some time. And so I choose to enter into my day. Setting the tone up here, I call it, by announcing before my God the most important thing about me. I am an alcoholic. And any time thereafter that I say I am an alcoholic, I am reminded that of all the things I do each day that God gives me, my most important job, work, task, assignment, is that I stay sober. And I do that best through the principles and traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous as they have been written. When I came to you a while back, you gave me a book, and you called it Big. I had cleared up enough to see that it wasn't a small book. It was a big book. I was also a first grade teacher at the time. And in the first grade, you teach the word big to the children, and you teach sizes and shapes. And I knew that this was a big book. The lady who gave it to me was much shorter than I was, and the book was so big, she held it in two hands, and she said, here is a big book. <laughs> no coincidence. 
As she was giving me the book, I looked over her head and I saw some of my brothers putting some signs on the wall. And I hit upon the one that said, keep it simple. And I said to myself, do these people practice what they preach? You cannot get much simpler than that. Here is a big book. Of course, now we have the paperback, which I have called the small, big book. Why don't you just call it the small book? Well, there's another book out in the bookstore in the mall in the recovery section, and it's called The Small Book. And it talks about being an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I call ours the small, big book. Well, you know, you introduce anything new in Alcoholics Anonymous and they send for you. <laughs> and one day this fellow came to me and he had a small, big book. And he said, hey, sister, you call this the small, big book. I said, I do. He said, that is a contradiction. I said, contradiction? What do you mean? He said, small, big, small, big. I said, well, we have had jumbo shrimp for years. Well, I took the book from you, the one that you called big, and this is what you said to me. You told me I should read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I should believe what I found there. I should share what I believe, and I should practice what I share. And you told me I should live my life based on what is found in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then you added another piece. And you told me I should do it along with the people who know how to do it best, the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then you called that a design for living. Well, what did I know about anything? I said, I'll see what I can do. And that design for living has worked so well for me a day at a time that I don't go looking and searching for other ways. I don't get excited about change anyway. The little sheep that strays from the flock is the one that's found in the ditch over the embankment and hanging from the barbed wire fence. I have a drunk log that would tell you quite well that all by myself I can stay very sick and quite drunk. But I truly believe I cannot stay sober and fairly well without you. One of my favorite fruits is the banana. And every time I eat a banana, I have a meditation. Whether I take the banana from the bunch or whether I take it out of the dish because somebody else took them off the bunch or whether I take it from that fancy hanger that they have now for bananas, each and every time I have a banana, I have a meditation. And the meditation is this. The banana that leaves the bunch is the one that gets skinned. (laughs) 
Alcohol became a way of life for me in a very short period of time. It dictated my moods, it made my decisions, it said you will, Maurice, and it said you won't. Things that I thought I put the final stamp of approval on, not when this first drink of alcohol came into my body, mind, and spirit. I was a first grade teacher at the time, and it would be 10 o'clock in the morning and I would be working very hard with my children. I had the reputation of being the first, best first grade teacher in that school, being the best teacher in that school. When the children came to me shortly after Labor Day in September, by the end of September, they were ready for college. <laughs> and I would be working very hard with my children 10 o'clock in the morning, and something would start in my body, mind, and spirit. And it wouldn't be saying, don't you need a cup of coffee? Don't you have to go out to the bathroom? It would be screaming in there, you need a drink. And the very next thing I would do would be to say to myself, I don't leave these children at 10 o'clock in the morning and go drinking. And I put up against that screaming what people told me I had so much of, willpower. And the willpower approach was futile. And I went on to learn that it wasn't that I was a weak-willed individual, but rather in the condition that I was in as a sick, untreated alcoholic, it went beyond the strength of my will to do other than to satisfy what was going on inside me. And so I would move to the next phase and I would say, well, it's a couple of minutes after 10. These children can go out to the bathroom, have their snack. I'll get the teacher next door to keep an eye on them. I'll go over to the convent, get a drink, and be back when this is all over. And I'd be running across the yard to the convent, and this would be my thought. This is going to be my last drink, at least until I've done my day's work. I was too sick to recall at that time that at 5 a.m., when the big bell went off to get us into our day, my story goes back to old God's time before we went mod. And we had this big bell that went off at 5 a.m. And for me to get into anything in those days, I had to reach over and take that drink. And I hated doing that. And each and every morning that I did that, I said, this is going to be the last one, at least until I've done my day's work. With all that I have learned about the disease of alcoholism and continue to learn about it, the most fascinating thing I have learned is that it's that first drink. After I took that first drink, everything would center around, when am I going to get the next one? And yet, if you met me along the street in those days and you said, Sister, could I ask you a question? Sure, ask me anything. Who or what is the center of your life? I would have been insulted by your question. You just called me sister. You see how I am dressed, every piece, from stem to stern. You just saw me come out of that building called Convent, and you're asking me who is the center of my life. How come you don't know that the center of my life is God? And I would have been insulted by your question. Today, thanks to you, I choose to live honestly. And I have no problem in sharing with you that the focus had shifted. And it shifted from God to that next drink. And I justified the use of alcohol in my life. I might say, too, because maybe someone here needs to hear it. It was not one of my goals in life to become an alcoholic. I do not believe I got up any dark and gloomy day or bright and sunny day and said, today's the day, Alki, by six tonight, watch me. I do not see alcoholism as self-inflicted. I believe it is a sickness that comes to a person. I think it's a marvelous and wonderful idea that we have steps that suggest to us in God's time 
that we make amends. I think that's a wonderful idea. But I don't hold myself responsible for the sickness that came to me. However, I hold myself very responsible for the life-giving, precious gift of sobriety that has been given to me. I did not get sober. I wasn't able to get sober. For years, I said, I got sober, you got sober, he got sober, we got sober. I don't believe a person can get sober. That's my opinion. I believe something bigger, greater, outside of that person takes place. They call it a miracle. And I believe the life-giving, precious gift of sobriety is given. And I believe it is given by one bigger, greater than all of us put together. I choose to call that one God. And so I feel very responsible to take care of the precious, life-giving gift of sobriety that God has given me. So much so that I have no problem in sharing with you. If you should ever hear that Maurice is back drinking, please don't call me a victim. Call me a volunteer. And the very next thing you should say about me is somewhere along the line, she wasn't willing to do everything necessary to stay sober. I cannot plead ignorance today. You have taught me and taught me well how to take care of that precious life-giving gift of sobriety that God has given me. After I announce before my God in the morning that I'm an alcoholic, the very next thing I do is pray the Lord's Prayer. And when I reach the part of the prayer that says, give us this day our daily bread, he will not refuse anyone who asks for the bread. He gives sufficient for the day, I believe. It is my responsibility then to take that daily bread and to use it to take care of that precious life-giving gift of sobriety. I was affected physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, and emotionally from this disease. Physically, I fared out pretty well, as far as we know. But there were times when I tried to arrange my own physical death. I used to take the car and leave the Bronx and go across the George and up the Palisades Parkway and pull over where you could sightsee. And I would say, when those cars are gone, when those people move away, I'm going to run this car over the embankment because I don't know what's the matter with me. And then I'd say, I'll go get a drink. I'll come back another time. That was a moment of amazing grace. So I was not to die physically. But you know, there are other ways of dying. Perhaps you can identify with them. I suffer the death of my values. I suffer the death of my integrity. I suffer the death of everything I stood for as a woman and everything I stood for as a sister. Outwardly, I looked pretty good. I held a job. I did it fairly well. I tried to keep up with my responsibilities. And above all, during this time, above all, I always said my prayers. And many of you have shared with me along the journey that you thought you missed the boat because you didn't pray enough. I prayed enough for you and all belonging to you. So this disease must be so big that something as powerful as prayer will not take it away. I don't believe you can just pray your way through your alcoholism. And yet we say prayer is a path where there is none. When all else fails, have I prayed? Where would we be without prayer? But I think for people like you and me, there's another piece that goes with the prayer. Pray and row the boat. (laughs) 
and this beautiful design for living that has been given to us enables us to do that, to pray and to row the boat. I denied that alcohol was my problem, and I was somewhat relieved when I learned that denial is the major presenting symptom of alcoholism, and when you are in denial from this disease, you are not in touch with reality. What I knew about my drinking would fit on a postage stamp. What was happening in my life was as big as the state of New York. But if I didn't have it up here when it was presented, then it didn't happen. And it would be a good idea if you went and took care of your own laundry. Sometimes people have said, you know, no one ever talked to me about my drinking. Thousands of people talked to me about mine. Some of them wanted to be martyrs at an early age. The nerve of that one to come in and talk to someone of my class and caliber about such a thing as drinking too much. And when I learned about denial, it helped me. And there were many times that I exercised the denial. For example, my mother was in the hospital having a total hip operation. She was there for quite a while. The operation wasn't as perfected then as it is today. And I went every single day to be at my mother's bedside because that's where a good daughter should be. And how do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? My beautiful mother would say to me, if you don't come tomorrow, it'll be just fine. My mother would say to me, you must have so much work to do around the convent. Why don't you skip a day? My beautiful mother could not bring herself to say, you're an embarrassment to me. You're no help to me. I don't need you around this hospital drunk. I have just one sister, and she's also a sister. Stationed in New York at the time that all of this was going on, and during my active alcoholism, my sister secretly wished she had joined a missionary community and lived in Mexico. It's hard to be proud of a sick, untreated alcoholic. I know that today. I didn't know it then. So my sister came to the hospital, and she gave me a little wink to come outside my mother's door. I dutifully went outside. My sister is very tall. She towers over me. She put her finger like this, and she said, Why? Why would you come to this hospital at 4 o'clock in the afternoon drinking? And I was just about to give a lecture when it dawned on me, I don't have to say anything. We've been down this road a hundred times before. To the best of my recollection, not a word did I speak. But being a typical alcoholic, and that's all that I am, I couldn't let well enough alone. I identify with the song, and perhaps you do too. You know the one, first you say you will, and then you won't. You know, you've made up your mind, you're not going to say anything. But you're going to put something on that record. And so I took my right hand, which was the more powerful of my two, and I belted her. Just at that moment, two nurses came running down the hall, and they are yelling, sisters, sisters. <laughs> Not because we were the duty girls, but we were dressed like sisters used to dress. Some still dress today. My veil was on the floor. Hers was someplace else. This is the famous special uh, hospital for special surgery in New York City. And with all the rules and regulations the hospital has, one of their major rules is that no one leaves their room unescorted. 
They were coming out in wheelchairs, crutches. <laughs> because the word got around very quickly. There were two nuns outside killing one another. Now, the crowd was kind of gathering, and I'm sure the people up close to my sister and myself, they could have been saying to one another, or maybe they couldn't even verbalize it. Oh, I know what that is. I live with that. And the people in the back, they could have been saying, oh, maybe it's a TV show or a movie. I didn't know it then, but I know it today, where there is just one sick untreated alcoholic, there can be utter chaos. Now, I had a couple of thoughts going on in this head of mine while all this is taking place. Interesting enough, perhaps you'll identify with it. I didn't have the thought, maybe I shouldn't have belted her. And I didn't have the thought, maybe I shouldn't have had that last drink before I came down here. Uppermost in my mind, right here. If only she hadn't screamed. I look back today with a sober, clear head, and it's kind of normal if you belt someone that they let out a hoot. But see, I wasn't in touch with reality. And the other thought I had, my purse had fallen onto the floor, making a rather loud sound as it fell to the floor. And I was a little preoccupied with the purse. I wasn't too concerned about the few dollars in the purse. I have a vow of poverty. I kept it quite well during this time. But I was very concerned about the pint of holy water in the purse. One pint of Christian Brothers brandy. <laughs> and what is the thinking of a sick, untreated alcoholic? No one leaves here with that bottle other than you know who. Now, there's only one word to describe somebody who would be in that position. And I had to go through a lot of other descriptions before you helped me to get to what is proper, right, and fitting. I had to go through such descriptions as bad, hopeless, weak-willed, sinner, you should know better. But the way I would describe someone today would be sick, unwell, not playing with full deck. <laughs> That's respectful. Oh, I heard a fellow one night, he described himself, he said he was a quart low. I heard another fellow another night, he said he had a photogenic mind, he just never had any film in the camera. <laughs> but I had to go away and have lots of help from you before I could see myself as sick and unwell. If you drink and you drive, you might miss the mark. It was an insult to show on your face that you were even thinking of driving us home. I brought you there, I bring you home. My first accident was in July of 17. My good friend, my nearest and dearest friend, Sister Rose, was in court over the dismissal of a teacher from her school. Rose was the principal, and there was a big to-do in the Archdiocese of New York. It was unheard of in those days that a sister would be taken to court. That has changed in recent times. Some of them... Are some of them are there every day of the week. Well, Rose had a lawyer appointed by the diocese, and I said, who knows more about this case than I do? I'll be in court to help the lawyer. How do we affect the people on the other side of the coin? The night before the trial, Rose called me up and she said, Maurice, please don't come to court. Not being in touch with reality, my thinking was, wow, there she is with all her pain. And she's thinking of me. <laughs> a 
Well, I have heard Ro share her story in that marvelous and wonderful program that parallels ours, that of Al-Anon. And indeed, Rose was thinking of herself, and rightly so. Well, it wasn't my style to push. I said to Rose, you're right. I'll go to my classes. I'll meet you downtown around lunchtime. You can brief me, and I'll advise you for the afternoon session. And to be rid of me, she said, fine. Well, I was in graduate school that summer, and I drove well fortified from the very top of New York City as far up in the Bronx as you can go, the Riverdale section of the Bronx. I drove to the very bottom of my city, the Wall Street section of my city. It was five minutes after 12 lunchtime, a working day in Wall Street, and the weather was clear. Those are all the things they tell you at the top of the police report. A United States mail truck happened to get in my way, and I smashed into it. When the policeman came on the driver's side, first word out of his mouth, Sister, you couldn't miss it. Every piece from stem to stern. I was a little taken back by the very next thing he said to me. He didn't even ask me if, if I were hurt or if he could have been my first-grade pupil at one time. He said, Sister, could you have been drinking? For a fleeting moment, I wondered how the man got on the police force. As was my style, officer, let me help you. And I proceeded to tell the officer how upset I was about this court case, etc., etc., etc. Well, I went into a blackout, a pass out, as was my custom, and I woke up in a convent a short distance away. I woke up in a strange bed, half my clothes on, half my clothes off. I didn't have a clue where I was. Believe you me, it was not my custom then, certainly not my custom today, to wake up in strange beds. <laughs> well, I'm around long enough to know that you have your story. <laughs> Drunk or sober, I woke up in my own bed. However, at a time like that, we all have the same tricks of the trade. Where am I, what happened, and how do you get out of here? <laughs> I put that game plan into operation, and I could see through a partially open door, I could see some bodies, and I could hear some voices. So I tiptoe over to this partially open door. Now, it wasn't my style, and most likely it wasn't your style, that you throw the door open and say what happened. So my game plan was that you hang out one earlobe through the partially open door to see if you can get a word to go on or something when they come in and ask you questions. So I have my ear hanging out there, and this is what I heard. There was a very tall sister, neither of us knew her, and she was beating up Rose, and she was saying to Rose, your friend is on pills or she's drinking, and in order to help her, you are going to have to hurt her. Oh, I thought that was poor advice. <laughs> so I took my earlobe in, and I tiptoed back to bed to get a little rest, to handle Rose, who Owing question in our lives at that time. What happened? I told it as I saw it. I lost control of the car because I was so upset about the court case. Now, the car was in my mother's name at that time. I had the car fixed back out on the road. I thought we were getting on with our lives, saving the world. Every time you talked to Rose, she had this question. When are we going to tell your mother about the accident? Never. Why do you want to tell my mother? Well, the car's in her name. So what? The car's fixed. Then the fears that set in for a sick, untreated alcoholic. What if Rose tells your mother? So you call Rose up, invite her out for supper, your treat. Take her to a little restaurant. 
lean across the table in the restaurant and say to Rose, if you dare to tell my mother about the accident, someday you will come out of your convent. I will be sitting in a car. And when you cross the street, that will be it. That is called threatening someone's life. Now, I always share that in my story. And one night, a hundred years ago now, that means a long time, we had a sister friend of ours who came to the meeting where I was speaking. She had never heard me speak. And at the end of the meeting, she came up and she pushed everybody aside and she said, this can't wait. I said, what's the matter with you? She said, do you really think you would have run over Rose? (laughs) And I thought for a moment and I said, let me tell it to you this way. Of myself, no. I wouldn't hurt a fly. It was not my style. Without a drink in me, since I was this high and well into adulthood, you never knew I was around. I wouldn't let you see me. But then you put just one drink in here. And you can paint the most tragic scene you can think of. And I could have been the one heading it up. It just wasn't to be part of my story. Or part of Rose's. that I would run her over. And I like to point out that it wasn't that I was reading my Bible or saying my night prayers or praying my rosary or attending Mass that it came to me, you shouldn't run over Rose. That isn't how it happened. You know how it happened? It was another example of that amazing grace. I had another accident and I took five parked cars with me. And I totaled two, damaged three plus my own. And the different effects that we have on people. What a nice policeman. He said, sister, could you help me fill out the report? I said, of course, officer. Where's the dog? Where's the dog? Well, the disease was progressing rapidly. And one day I got a call from my boss, the head of my community. Now, this call was equivalent to the Pope calling you to Rome. That's how serious a call it was. And there were only two reasons in those days why the major superior would send for you. One, you were in trouble. Or there was a special assignment that only you could do. So I'm driving up to see the boss, and this is my thinking. I have enough to do. So I get there, and we have a little chit-chat, and she was very gentle with me. She said, Maurice, I'll get to the point. She said, some of the sisters are saying that you drink too much. Now, in those days, when the big boss spoke, you didn't ask questions. You just listened. I asked a question. I stuttered when I asked it. I said, where are they? She got a little nervous because I guess I was the first one who ever asked her a question. And she said, oh, she said, they don't want to be mentioned. I said to myself, they feared for their lives. (laughs) And, you know, in a very sick and negative way, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. 
I was into one of our steps, but in a negative way at that moment. Made a list. <laughs> of all people who had harmed me. And asked God to be rid of them. And I sat there writing one contract after another. So then I figured I'd ask a question. I said, do you really know anything about me? And she said, well, I have this folder. And she went and she got a folder and she peeked in and she said, oh, I didn't know you were doing this in the parish. And oh, look what you're involved in the diocese. And you're going to get your master's degree. And she closed the folder and she said, you know, Maurice, I will never, ever again believe this about any of our sisters. I said, that's a good policy to follow. <laughs> she gave me an apology and off I went. And as I walked back to the car, I had one thought and one thought only. She will never, ever send for me again. And she never did. Next time she arrived unannounced and put me away. <laughs> so when I learned about denial and you're not in touch with reality, it helped me immensely. I was angry and resentful during this time. Angry with God. I've given my life to God. What more do you want? I love the word relationship. And I learned about relationships from you. You've been my teachers about relationships. As I look around this, this room this evening, people that have been in my life through this marvelous and wonderful design for living, but prior to recovery, relating to God, since I was this high and well into adulthood, this is what I did. I sat up straight and I knelt up straight and I had techniques. And I stayed long periods of time trying to get closer to this God, whoever or whatever he was. And then when I was drinking, it was taking God on. If you don't need me. Well, I don't need you. And if I don't need someone bigger, greater outside of this lady here, I wonder who I think I am. And so I was angry and resentful against God, and that simply turned into another drink and another bottle. And I was depressed during this time. I was in the convent many years before I picked up my first drink. I didn't like the taste of alcohol. I never used alcohol. And my beautiful father, Maurice, went to God in 1967. And he was to receive the precious life-giving gift of sobriety in a somewhat different manner from the way I received it. He received it upon his death. Because at that moment, I believe is perfection. And what you are lacking, you receive at that moment when you meet your God eyeball to eyeball. And I buried my father. And I went way inside. And I picked up my first drink. And shortly thereafter, my mother said to me one day, she said, you know, while we have you, your father is not gone. And I know today we were carbon copies of one another. And so I was using alcohol to lift me out of a depression after my father's death. And the bargaining stage. I did a lot of bargaining during this time, and I did it all with God. And one bargain I like to share on, I got into bed one night with my rosary beads in one hand, as was my custom, hanging on to my sheets with the other hand. And I'm no sooner in the bed when I feel I have to get up and take a drink. And I said to God, please, please don't let me drink tonight. And I made all these promises to God. Well, you know how the story goes. The rosary beads go to the floor and the covers get pushed back. And you get out of bed and you don't even have to turn on the light because you know where your bottle is. 
and I took another drink. And on that particular night, one of the few times I didn't go into a blackout right away, after I took that drink, I beat that floor, and I doubted the existence of God. How could a God who loved me? God, I just asked you to help me. I bet there's no God. I live right in the heart of New York City. And when I'm in town, I drive on the FDR Drive, the East River Drive. And I see our brothers and sisters building their homes on both sides of that highway. They build them out of cardboard boxes and plastic bags. And once in a while, you see them frying an egg. And they need a pair of shoes and a pair of socks, and they need a buck. And they need a good meal. And you know, if our brothers and sisters on that highway went over to the guardrail and beat the guardrail and doubted the existence of God, we'd say, well, those poor socks. I'm in a beautiful convent. I want for nothing. And alcohol brought me to the point where I doubted the existence of God. As we say in here, whether you come from Yale or jail, Park Avenue, Park Bench, what does it matter? Where do we go from here? We all have our story. But with the next breath, I begin again. And the other thing I did that same night was I cried out at the top of my lungs, isn't there anybody anywhere who knows what I'm going through? Well, I didn't know you were up the street and around the corner and a few miles away going through the same thing, but I'm mighty glad, mighty glad that somewhere along our journey, God saw fit that we would find one another in this beautiful fellowship. And I believe it is God who has arranged our meeting. C.S. Lewis says in one of his writings about relationships, he talks about relationships in general, and he says it's as if God says to the people in the relationship, you have not chosen one another, but I, God, have chosen you for one another. And if you think of the relationships that you have in this fellowship. Would you of yourself have chosen those people? Or was it not all arranged? If we think of the gatehouse in Akron, Ohio, where Bill and Dr. Bob had their first meeting, wasn't that arranged by God? Another example of an amazing grace. And so today I make bargains and I make deals and I'm able to follow through. I attribute that to one fact and one fact only. I don't drink alcohol while I'm sober. Very significant in Maurice's life. And the final stage is acceptance. The disease was progressing rapidly, and it all came to a head because I had a lot of do-gooders in my life, but I had two exceptional do-gooders, my sister and Rose. And keeping it very simple, they snitched. They blew the whistle and they turned me in and they brought the same boss that I had met before. They brought it to my mother's where I was hiding out. And things moved rapidly. I noticed a marked change in my boss. She wasn't interested in anything that I had to say. And everything she said was in past tense. 
She said, arrangements have been made. And they are expecting you in Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois. And she said, there you will find out what is wrong with you, and you'll be there for 28 days. Now she said, you could go Friday or Saturday. I figured I'd be dead by Saturday. I said, I'll go Saturday. And I went into that facility with this thinking. When they get a look at someone of my class and caliber, I'll be back on the next plane. And when I got out there, I met you. It was obvious to me why you were there. <laughs> With stories like you had, you belong there. 64 patients, men and women, one by one, they all made their way to me, and this is what they would do. They would beat up on themselves. They would say terrible things about themselves, but they would always finish by saying, you know, sister, you're not like me. You shouldn't be here. Well, now, anyone who thinks like I do is going to be my friend. I said, maybe I could help these people. By the end of the first week, I was a therapist. And the word got around very quickly. If you don't like your counselor, you don't understand what's going on here, you talk to sister. She knows everything about everything. Now, we had one free hour in this program, and the same time every day, and we were supposed to read and write and listen to tapes, and I always did as I was told. Since I was this high, well into adulthood, I always did as I was told, whether it was right, wrong, out of my league. I never knew that sitting in here, I, t I talk about the gifts that sit in here. One of them is power of choice. I never knew I had power of choice, you see. I just never got to turn the light on. I thought I was deprived of power of choice. You see. So they told me, stay in my room, do this, that. There I was doing it. And I'd set the table up, and we had nice equipment and books. I'd be there two minutes, and I'd pitch the whole thing up in the air, and I'd go to the wall, and I'd bang my head on the wall, yelling and screaming at God, why me? I've been so good, and look at what you've done to me. And my roommate would run out, and she'd say she's at it again. They'd come in. They'd calm me down. I was so angry with God. Sometimes there'd be blood pouring out of my head. And you know, I was too sick at that time. And you know, long before that time, going back as a little kid, well into adulthood, I was too sick to hear God say, you don't have to be good. You are good. I never knew that. You helped me to get in touch with that. You don't have to be good. You are good. I cannot help but be impressed at the blessing and holiness that sits and stands before me in this room. Well, a good few 24 hours since that time, I have the same question, and I ask it of God frequently. Why me, God? Not why me, why am I an alky, but why me, God, why am I sober, since most people don't receive this gift. And I don't want to go through the motions of sobriety. And so I ask that question frequently. And he answers very loud and very clear. And he says, Maurice, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And he says, many are called to the disease of alcoholism. Very few, a drop in the bucket, are chosen for the precious life-giving gift of sobriety. And I say, well, why me? 
And he says, make your little chart. I make a little chart, and I headed alcoholism, and I put a simple line down the center, and I put on this side of the chart, all of us in recovery, round the world. And then we put on this side of the chart, all of those who are still out there. You wouldn't even see us. I find it awesome to be on that side of the chart. And so I say again to God, well, why me? And he says, Maurice, how do you see death? A hundred years ago now, that means a long time, I struggled with death. I found it so negative. And I sat with death. And I read a line that I had read many times before, but again, it was an example of that amazing grace. And the line was, there's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. And that's on God's calendar, I believe. Whether you are 2, 22, or 102, whether you die in your sleep, AIDS, alcoholism, cancer, fire. We're all dying of something, and I believe the death takes place when our work is finished. I have to see positive things about what appears to be so negative. And I can't believe my God stands or sits any place and says, I'm taking that child, I'm taking that parent, I'm taking that spouse. But your work is finished come to the big meeting in the sky makes sense to me today well the point is untreated alcoholism is 100% fatal most people who have the disease die of it look at the figures, the numbers well then we have this side of the chart and here we are I believe our death has been interrupted because our work is not finished Be assured there'll be tragedy in our world tonight. Some people will go to God, others will be saved. Those who are saved, I believe their work is not finished. But I don't know their work. I believe ours is defined. It's to carry a message. It's to walk with. It's to pass it on. It's to be a part of that design for living the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. With all due respect to the other helps, the church, the medical profession, they lend us a hand, but there's just something about one alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. And you know, It almost seems like a contradiction. A bunch of folks where somewhere along the line it was said to us, go away, get lost, who needs you? We can't count on you, you're here again. And look at the assignment. Being in touch with that enables me to walk very tall today as a sober, recovering alcoholic woman. And very late in the fourth week, I came to grips with this. In a small way, I saw that I was an alcoholic. And my counselor said, we have a prescription for you to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, if you're faithful to the prescription, you will only have to return here as our guest. I said, I won't make any promises. I'll see what I can do. And by the grace of God and faithfulness to Alcoholics Anonymous, to that design for living a day at a time, I haven't found it necessary to pick up a drink or any substitute since that April 17th, 1971. I am not one who says I will never, ever drink again. If I thought I would never drink again, perhaps I wouldn't be as faithful. 
early this morning, I asked for bread. Daily bread. I do not have tomorrow's bread. You know, there are advantages to years of sobriety. I've had them. But as the years of sobriety increase, so do the perils of smugness. And so a day at a time, I continue to be faithful to that design for living that was given to me a good few 24 hours ago now. And I came into the Forest Hills group, and I did the old one too. I went to meetings, and I didn't drink, and I didn't drink, and I went to meetings. And I could always be found in the third row, all crumpled up, waiting for this thing to be over. But I was doing the best I could at that time. And one night I heard a fellow share, and he said that he learned unless he put those 12 suggested steps into his life and made some changes, he could very well lose his sobriety. Well, it was like a shot in the arm to me, because I sat up real tall. I managed to put a little smirk on my face, because I wanted this man to see me, because I felt he was going to say, of course we don't mean that for the little sister there in the third row. And the man never said it. And with the help of my sponsor and a few other folks, I came to the realization of why I was so miserable I had not changed. I would hear the expression many times, change or die. And I would poke the one next to me and say, isn't there something in between? But do you know, right up until this moment, that's what's there for me. Change or die. You know, with other sicknesses, you can stabilize. You don't get any better. You don't get any worse. I feel I'm always in motion. I'm getting weller or I'm going back. And so little by slowly, change started to come in Maurice's life. And three major changes that have taken place. I start with the intellectual. When I came to you, my thinking would fit on a postage stamp. My thinking was either a one or a ten. I was to the extreme in my thinking. My thinking went ready, fire, aim. And we talked about that, and you said, listen, if you take the suggestions, you make some changes, you'll be able to broaden that picture up there, and you'll get off that postage stamp thinking. And you were right. And then the moral conversion. My value system went out the window with this disease, and that bothered me terribly. And you said, hey, listen. Put those tools for change. Use those steps. And you'll be able to put first things first and second things second. And when you're wrong, you'll be able to promptly admit it. And you'll be able to practice the principles in all your affairs. And you'll be able to practice the principles and you won't have affairs. And so a moral conversion has taken place in my life. And then the spiritual, which happened in two ways. I was to the extreme with religion. I wasn't just Catholic. I was very, very, very Catholic. I had little flags that waved here, Catholic, Catholic, very, very <laughs> So you told me I should be striving for balance in every area of my life. That's what you suggested to me. And so I, I came back from the extreme with religion, got more centered with religion. And then the spiritual. I said, well, what is spirituality? And you told me it has to do with life and living and love and loving in relationship with God, self, and others. 
I said, what is there to relate to? There's nothing here. And you said, we'll help you get in touch. And I got a relationship with myself, which I believe is key to the relationships in the other two areas, relating to others and relating to God. And today I have a life-giving, healthy, meaningful spirituality, thanks to you. And the other big thing that happened, I was in the third row, all crumpled over. I was so ashamed. I walk very tall today. When God gives the gift of sobriety, I believe he says three things to us. One, I'm interrupting your death because your work is not finished. Carry a message. Walk with. Pass it on. Help other people take care of their gift. He says, secondly, you will share relationship with these people. They will come into your life and you will come into theirs in this fellowship. And he says, third, with this precious life-giving gift of sobriety, I give you your dignity. Walk tall. The miracle still takes place. I eventually come to the end. I borrow from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, from the chapter Me and Alcoholic. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in any other effort I had made to save myself. Here was power. Here was power to live to the end of any given day. Power to have courage. Power to face the next day. Power to have friends. Power to help people. Power to be sane. Power to stay sober. As I look around this room this evening, I cannot help but be impressed with the blessing and holiness that sits and stands before me. And I also note that it's possible to die and to rise again. And the very short version of Maurice's story, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And may God bless you, and God bless me. And God keep you, and God keep me. Because nobody does it quite as well. Thank you so very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.